Hello, and welcome to Jorkler's Fandom. Here, all things pop culture are on the table. My goal is to add something to the conversation surrounding the movies, shows, and video games that have shaped us and continue to play a big role in our lives. For this first video, I'll be taking a look at the popular Nintendo game, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss future videos. Now, let's get started. It is often said among the Zelda fandom that the newest game in the series is always the least popular, especially those that significantly change something about the Zelda formula. Majora's Mask, with its three-day cycle, took a few years to gain the appreciation it has now. Wind Waker was reviled when it was announced, but in time has been recognized as one of the best in the series. While Breath of the Wild has mostly bucked this trend, it does have its detractors by virtue of being so different from the games that preceded it. This was not the case with Twilight Princess. Let me clarify. Twilight Princess definitely had its turn as the punching bag for Zelda fans. It was commonly criticized for being too similar to Ocarina of Time, overly linear, and not really adding anything to the series or innovating in any meaningful way. This lasted from when it came out in 2006 to around Skyward Sword's release in 2011. But if anything, most Zelda fans have moved on to accept it as a worthy entry in the franchise. Most Zelda fans. Glamorous. Twilight Princess never sat right with me, and to this day I am surprised when it is held in high regard. There are many other games that I don't care for where there is something obvious holding it back. Maybe it's poorly designed, or it doesn't take advantage of its hardware, or it holds your hand to an insulting degree. And that isn't the case with Twilight Princess, but my negativity towards it requires a more nuanced explanation, starting with a look at how it all began. May 2004. George W. Bush was president, Shrek 2 was dominating the box office, and the Nintendo GameCube was in the middle of its lifespan. Wind Waker had been incredibly divisive, and while a sequel was supposedly in the works, it had not proven as popular in the North American market as Nintendo had hoped. One point to understand is that businesses, entertainment in particular, are reactionary and often risk-averse. You don't have to look far for examples of this, as it is what dominates our media today. Nintendo was sitting in third place in that generation's console wars, behind Sony's PlayStation 2 and Microsoft's Xbox. A colorful, vibrant game like Wind Waker was seen as childish and contributed to Nintendo's kiddie image, which was why they were behind the supposedly more mature PS2 and Xbox. They would need a real game changer, and a safe bet, to close that gap in its waning years. So at E3 2004, the gaming world was rocked by the first glimpse of the game that would eventually be known as Twilight Princess. Fans were thrilled. This was what Zelda on the GameCube should have looked like all along. No cell shading or ocean in sight, an adult Link back in the sack. Even though only a minute long trailer was shown, it flipped everything on its head. And it is said that grown men cried during the trailer. And this was the last we saw of Untitled Legend of Zelda game, until the Game Developers Conference in March 2005, where another short trailer was shown. This in and of itself was huge news, as although Nintendo had started early with the hype, they weren't actually showing too much. Fans speculated what the title could be, what other Zelda characters would make an appearance, and where it would take place in the then-elusive timeline. At E3 2005, our patience was rewarded with a huge info dump about the game, including its title, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, and a full trailer featuring Link's new wolf transformation, scored by Michiru Oshima, whose Godzilla themes are among my favorites in that series. Make no mistake, this was a big production. 
Nintendo was clearly going for an epic, dark, and mature tone with Twilight Princess. At the time, Lord of the Rings had recently cleaned up at the box office and the Oscars, and this was the tone Nintendo was seeking to emulate. The trailers all featured copious footage of Link on horseback, Link fighting demonic beasts, and Link transforming into a wolf to wander through the black and white Twilight Realm. At this point, Nintendo was full-on hyping up Twilight Princess as the next big thing. The first issue of the redesigned Nintendo Power featured Twilight Princess on the cover, and nearly every issue that followed for the next several months had pages devoted to it. Nintendo even held some contests around Twilight Princess, one of the rewards of which was a shirt, which yours truly is lucky enough to still own. Along with this, it was slated to come out November 2005 as a sort of last hurrah of the GameCube before their new system, then known as the Revolution, launched the following year. It's funny because there were two games that actually did come out in 2005 that, separately, managed to nail both the story-driven fantasy epic with characters who turn into animals and the melancholy atmospheric adventure on horseback that Twilight Princess was aiming for. And oddly enough, they came out in North America only one day apart. But Twilight Princess would not be joining them, as it was delayed from its original release date of November 2005. This was one of the last remaining games on the GameCube fans were looking forward to, and they were understandably upset, especially after Nintendo had spent so much of the previous summer pimping it out. But director Aiji Onuma and producer Shigeru Miyamoto felt the game wasn't ready yet, and didn't want to cut things from the game as they had to do in the past to keep to their release schedule. As Miyamoto said, A delayed game is eventually good but a rushed game is forever bad. The hype machine continued chugging along into 2006. The most notable event of the first half of the year was E3 2006, where a new trailer was shown. The Twilight Realm, rather than being in black and white, now featured ultra-saturated colors and bloom lighting. The release date was also finalized, and Twilight Princess would be releasing in November for Nintendo's new console, the Wii, and December for the GameCube. The Wii version of the game sold incredibly well, as it was the main first-party game available at the time, aside from Wii Sports, which was bundled with the console. The GameCube version sold decently, considering it was releasing for a system that was already obsolete. There's no question Twilight Princess was a financial success and a boon for the Zelda and Nintendo brands. But was it a good game? Up to this point, most of what I have presented is factual, as a way of contextualizing the narrative surrounding Twilight Princess and why it turned out the way it did. What follows is my opinion on the final product. Another questionable trope among Zelda fans is that the first game you played is your favorite in the series. Because if it was your first Zelda game and it brought you to the series, it must be your favorite, right? I can't speak for others, but for me this actually wasn't the case. My first Zelda was Ocarina of Time, which I played on the pre-order disc that came with Wind Waker in early 2003. I didn't actually pre-order Wind Waker, mind you, but I had heard Ocarina was an incredible game and wanted to play it. So I found a used copy, and a month or so later, I had beaten Ocarina of Time. And I loved it. I never owned an N64, but I understood the game's significance. It had brought Zelda into the Polygon era with incredible worlds and a game design that stood the test of time. In an era where Nintendo had a tough competitor in Sony, it showed that Nintendo hadn't lost any of its edge, and could still produce a challenging fantasy epic. As a kid whose only console was a GameCube, I didn't have many options for more Zelda. So, reluctantly, I picked up a copy of the only other Zelda game available for the system, Wind Waker. My expectations weren't very high. Link looked like a Powerpuff Girl, and I expected to miss Ocarina's more realistic graphical style. And that is why you play a game before passing a verdict on it. I loved Wind Waker. 
To this day, it is my favorite in the series, and in all honesty, my favorite game of all time. I loved the Great Sea and how much opportunity for exploration it presented you. I didn't mind the sailing at all. And the graphical style conveyed so much more emotion than most so-called realistic games at the time. Link's name is Link because he is meant to connect the player with the world of the game. And few Zelda games have done this as well as Wind Waker. Wind Waker took what Ocarina of Time had built and did something wildly different with it. Complete graphical overhaul, a more expansive and open world than anything we had seen up to that point in the series, and a story that was brilliant in its meta-commentary on the state of the franchise. Ganondorf wants to resurrect Hyrule and go back to the way things used to be, but a new generation instead will have to carve their own path. A brilliant ending that no Zelda has touched since. As I made my way through other titles in the Zelda canon, I recognized that the series was at its best when it innovated, while keeping true to the sense of mystery, exploration, and wonder that Zelda is about at its core. A Link to the Past, Majora's Mask, The Minish Cap, all of these titles offered something unique to the series, and built upon what came before. Just like how The Legend of Zelda is a similar story retold multiple times with added wrinkles, so too is the gameplay. And then we come to Twilight Princess. How does Twilight Princess differentiate itself from the Zeldas that came before it? Let's go through a few of the most commonly cited possibilities. Horseback Riding Ah yes, this was definitely a much-touted aspect of Twilight Princess, specifically that combat on horseback would play a more prominent role than in previous games. Miyamoto and Onuma both expressed excitement for this emphasis on horseback, something that had been missing from Wind Waker. Wolf Link The centerpiece of the game's promotional material, Wolf Link was featured on the cover of the game. Link being able to turn into a wolf was something new to the series, and was a key selling point of what promised to be a darker and more mature title in the series. Which brings us to our next point. Mature Tone Ever since the Space World 2000 demo showing Link facing off against Ganondorf in a sword duel, a more mature Zelda title was what the fanbase had been clamoring for. This demand was only exacerbated by the release of Wind Waker. You even had major publications like IGN calling for a game where Link seeks revenge after Ganon murders Zelda. So a mature tone in terms of story and visual presentation was something the fanbase had demanded for a long time and which Twilight Princess seemed poised to deliver. Keep these bullet points in mind as we will come back to them later. I'll talk about the game in four main segments. Story, music, visuals, and gameplay. Story. The game drops you into Link's daily life as a farmhand herding goats and running errands for the town folk of Ordon Village. From the very first line of the game, they really start hammering in the melancholy tone. This is going to be a cool Zelda game with a cool Link. Link even has a posse of kids who follow him around and comment on how cool he is. I see how the developers wanted to play up Link's humble origins while also trying to make him a believable action hero, but these are the most mundane of tasks and characters to start off a premier Nintendo game. In fact, the opening of Twilight Princess is actually a lot like the opening of Wind Waker. Link lives in a remote community, a younger companion gets taken away from him. Link gives chase, but ends up needing help from the game's plucky female to advance. Link explores the villain's stronghold before finding he isn't strong enough yet and returning to the outside world. The key difference between Twilight Princess and Wind Waker's openings is that Twilight Princess's is considerably more drawn out, despite the opening cramming in a lot of story. Along with the kids, we meet Midna, who takes advantage of Link and helps him escape Hyrule Castle, Princess Zelda, who mourns the fall of her kingdom to Twilight, 
and we learn of Xant, the usurper king of the Twilight Realm that Midna hails from. Link sets out to find the fused shadows and rid Hyrule of Twilight, for some reason. We are never really shown why it's bad that Twilight covers Hyrule. Uh, Zelda says the people of Hyrule become spirits in the Twilight, but are unaware of this. All the people know now is fear of a nameless evil. <laughs> Sounds like me when I shop for car insurance. Remember in Majora's Mask when the moon was falling out of the sky and all of the NPCs were reacting to that in varied yet believable ways? Yeah, we get none of that here. Hyrule doesn't feel like a living, breathing world with or without the twilight. Is perpetual twilight really all that bad? Well, is it? This story is just going through the motions. When you meet Faron, you get the hero's tunic because it belonged to the ancient hero. I cannot emphasize enough how lazy this is. Other games give a logical reason for why Link wears the tunic. In Ocarina of Time, it's what all Kokiri wear. Wind Waker, it's what boys wear when they come of age to honor the hero of legend. Skyward Sword, it was the Skyloft Academy garb the year Link was graduating. Twilight Princess, well, it was the hero's clothes, and you're the hero now. Here you go, don't let it wrinkle. Link spends the first half of the game traveling to the Forest Temple, the Goron Mines, and the Lake Bed Temple. Hmm. Forest, mountain, and lake. Where have I seen this before? For each segment, there is a Tears of Light section you complete as a wolf, followed by a dungeon. You do this three times, and then Xant pops up, steals your fused shadows, and traps Link in his wolf form while injuring Midna. Desperate, Link takes Midna to see Princess Zelda, hoping she can break their curse. Zelda is powerless to help, but tells Link to find the Master Sword in the Sacred Grove, and then gives her power to Midna in order to save her. Zelda's own body disappears as a result. This scene falls flat, for a couple of reasons. First, we aren't really clear on what exactly Zelda is doing. I think she is transferring her Triforce of Wisdom to Midna, but what happens to Zelda afterwards? Uh, does she lose her body but continue to exist as a spirit? Uh, if that's the case, why can't we see her with our wolf senses like we can with the other spirits? Uh, did she save her consciousness to the cloud or something? The game never explains this, and it'll get even more nonsensical in just a bit. And second, we don't care about Zelda. All we know is that she is the Princess of Hyrule and feels guilty that she wasn't able to protect her kingdom from Xant. She has no connection to Link, and her sacrifice doesn't have any emotional weight. Link goes to the Lost Woods to retrieve the Master Sword, which breaks him out of his wolf form. Midna tells Link to seek out the Mirror of Twilight at Arbiter's Grounds so they can go back to the Twilight Realm and face Xant. It isn't really clear why we should care enough to do this, since the Twilight itself is now confined to an orange diamond around Hyrule Castle. The Twilight, which again is bad for reasons that are vague at best, has been forced back thanks to our efforts in the first half of the game. This completely kills any tension in the story. Remember in Ocarina of Time how Ganondorf had taken over Hyrule and you had to win it back from him dungeon by dungeon? That's how you build action. The stakes got higher over the course of the game. In Twilight Princess, Xant confronts you after you get the third fused shadow piece and then sits in his palace for the entire rest of the game other than a brief scene where he awakens Stalord. After clearing the Arbiter's grounds, Link and Midna learn that years ago the sages attempted to execute Ganondorf, but he was saved by the sudden appearance of the Triforce of Power killing a sage before being banished to the Twilight Realm. There is never a clear explanation for why he has the Triforce of Power. My own headcanon is that when young Link came back from seven years in the future, he had the Triforce of Courage, which split the Child Timeline's Triforce and gave Ganondorf the Triforce of Power. It isn't too big of a leap, but it does mean that the Triforce can apparently come and go as it pleases, which will be important later. 
The sages tell Link and Midna to collect the remaining pieces of the Mirror of Twilight. The pair travel to Snow Peak, the Temple of Time, and the City in the Sky, getting a piece of the mirror in each of these places. Soon, it is time for them to head to the Twilight Realm and face Zant. Here, we learn that Zant usurped Midna's throne, seeking to free their tribe from the half-existence to which they had been banished. This is an interesting plot element that never really gets explored, as we are quickly distracted by Zant's contortions, twirling, and high-pitched screeches. I didn't mind Zant's sudden shift in characterization, which continued into his boss battle. It made what was otherwise a boring and generic villain somewhat memorable as we watch his mental state deteriorate bit by bit. After defeating him, we learn that Zant is a puppet, and Ganondorf has been behind Zant's power this whole time. Yep, a character who was mentioned earlier but who we have no personal connection with is now the main villain. It's a shallow ending, with nothing to offer but empty fan service, the kind of thing J.J. Abrams would write. Somehow Palpatine returned. Link and Midna head to Hyrule Castle and face Ganondorf in a final boss fight that I'll delve into more later. Oh, and Zelda is somehow not dead. They save the day, Ganondorf dies standing up after his Triforce piece scoots, Midna goes back to the Twilight Realm and breaks the mirror, whoop de doo the end. Let's talk about Midna. She's one of the most recognizable aspects of Twilight Princess, and commonly cited as one of the best characters in the entire Zelda series. Midna is beloved by fans for having a compelling and emotional story arc. It is impossible to separate the story of Twilight Princess from the character of Midna, and I hesitate to even call her a sidekick because of this. The plot is intertwined with a single character in a way that we have not seen before or since in a Zelda title. So if Midna's character doesn't work for you, it's pretty likely the story of Twilight Princess won't work for you either. And Midna doesn't do much for me. First, she has no redeeming qualities. She spends the first half of the game belittling and talking down to Link at every turn and is using him out of convenience for her own ends. We learn later in the game that she is the leader of the Twilight and was usurped by Zant, but throughout the whole game, she never shows any qualities of a leader. It takes Zelda sacrificing herself for Midna to show even a shred of compassion, which basically amounts to, she stops treating Link like shit. Her character development is unearned and feels hollow. And this is a major issue once you realize that Twilight Princess is Midna's story, and only Midna's story. Sure, there are other characters who pop in and out, but they are window dressing and only exist to serve the game's aesthetic. Link certainly has no reason to be there. He is Midna's tool, a blunt object, hired muscle, and nothing more. She literally rides Link. I don't know how they could have spelled it out more clearly. People complained about Link being King Daphnis' tool to get what he wants in Wind Waker, which I can kind of see, but here it's much, much worse. The entire conflict of the story is centered on Midna. Her desire for revenge against Zant drives the plot, and even at the very end of the game, her main beef is with Ganondorf, who barely acknowledges Link is even there. Link is wallpaper, and as the connective tissue between the player and the game, this made me feel like wallpaper when playing Twilight Princess. The story is a mess, where nothing flows logically. Events follow one another with no regard as to what has happened previously, and characters drop in and out of the story without warning. If you are using and instead of but to tell your story, it is a sign of poor writing. Twilight Princess has lots of ands, but no buts. Music. There are a few tracks in Twilight Princess that I'm quite fond of. The Twilight Princess main theme, or what you hear in Hyrule Field, is memorable but with an asterisk. I'll come back to this one. The use of Midna's lament in the story lends Midna a pathos that she wouldn't otherwise have. 
I'd argue that the callbacks to Ocarina via music conceptually work. We recall the Goron City, Zora's Domain, and Lost Woods themes from Ocarina of Time, but reimagined to mesh with the new aesthetic. It draws a favorable comparison to the use of the Dragon Roost Island theme in Breath of the Wild's Rio Village. Clearly the same tune, but different enough so as not to be a rehash. My disappointment is that all the best parts of the soundtrack come as callbacks to Ocarina of Time. There are always going to be themes and motifs repeated from one Zelda game to another. That's part of the experience. To imagine a Legend of Zelda game without the original overworld tune is to imagine a Harry Potter movie without Hedwig's theme. But there need to be new themes to make Twilight Princess a distinct entry in the series. So how does it fare in that regard? The main new element of the soundtrack is the Twilight Princess main theme I mentioned earlier, which plays in Hyrule Field. I personally think it's a bit aggressive to work as an overworld theme, but it is a solid and original piece of music. The problem is that half of the new elements of the soundtrack are derived from this motif. Just listen. also represents a regression from Wind Waker, in that there is clearly a lesser amount of original material than there was in the previous console game. To illustrate, Wind Waker had a unique theme for each of its bosses, all of which are distinctive and memorable. Twilight Princess reuses boss themes several times. A couple of these are good, I like the Morpheal and Argorok theme and the Blizzetta theme, but the majority of them are extremely forgettable. The dungeon music is either similarly forgettable or actively painful to listen to. On top of this, Twilight Princess was the last console Zelda to not have an orchestral soundtrack. And it's not like Nintendo games didn't have this at the time. Both Donkey Kong Jungle Beat and Star Fox Assault, which had come out the previous year, had an orchestral score as did the following year's Super Mario Galaxy, but not Twilight Princess. At the time, this wasn't talked about much, but in retrospect, it is a huge missed opportunity. The same could be said about the game's lack of voice acting. While it took way too long for the Zelda series to finally dip its toes into voice acting, not implementing it in Twilight Princess, such a story-heavy game with a more mature tone, Seems like another missed opportunity. Twilight Princess's music has been somewhat redeemed outside of the game by things like the 25th anniversary concert and Zelda reorchestrated's Twilight Symphony. But within the game itself, the score doesn't make much of an impact, especially compared to its predecessors. In a review that is already an opinion piece, this is perhaps the most subjective part of it, but I believe the music is a clear step down. Visuals A major selling point of Twilight Princess was its more realistic graphics compared to Wind Waker. Gone were the unrealistic proportions, the bright colors, and the cell shading. In their place were, um, different unrealistic proportions, lots of browns and greens, and grittiness. I can see what Nintendo was going for with the art direction. They wanted whimsical, but mature. Perhaps something in the vein of Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Some of the characters are well designed. I like Agatha. Zant is a great addition to the aesthetic of the game. Even though I didn't care for his inclusion, I really like Ganondorf's design, the perfect evolution of his designs from Ocarina of Time and Wind Waker, while adding new elements. But for every good design, you have at least a couple really bad designs. 
This was touted as a realistic Zelda game, and yet you have character designs like this, this, and this. <laughs> Demon baby aside, the children are all incredibly dull. Despite supposedly being important characters, Colin and Ilya are barely distinguishable from one another. This even extends to the enemies. The Bokoblins in this game have no personality or swagger, and the same could be said of the bosses, who with one or two exceptions are incredibly mundane creatures. Keep in mind that the GameCube wasn't exactly a graphical powerhouse, and any console from its generation looks dated today. Even the HD remake doesn't really change the graphics very much the way other Zelda remakes have. Visuals aren't the end-all be-all for a video game, but at the bare minimum, they should be interesting to look at since you'll be staring at them for several hours. I find the brown, washed-out look to be visually uninteresting, and after two hours trying to leave a village composed of browns and greens, you can imagine my disappointment when the first dungeon was nothing but... <sighs> browns and greens. Gameplay I could go into my laundry list of gameplay choices Twilight Princess makes that I think are nonsensical and kill its pacing. But rather than doing that, I am going to focus on one segment in particular that serves as a microcosm illustrating all the things wrong with the game. The final boss fight. This is easily the worst final boss fight in any of the 3D Zelda games. In no small part because it overstays its welcome to such an obnoxious degree. The fight is separated into four main segments, the first of which is Puppet Zelda, who is introduced so haphazardly into the story that she seems to serve no purpose other than an excuse to shoehorn a tennis match with a ball of energy into the game. I already mentioned this in the story section, but how did Zelda even come back after giving her life to Midna? How are you not dead? I have no idea! What's Ganondorf's connection with her in this game to the point that he wants to possess her? None of these questions are ever answered, and the princess is further disgraced. The second segment, Beast Ganon, is the best of the bunch. As one of the very few bosses in the game you can fight as Wolf Link, it's a cool callback to wrangling goats in Ordon Village. I also love Twilight Princess's interpretation of Ganon. He is a hog from hell, chasing Link on all fours throughout the fight. The music also captures the demon from another world angle really well. It's a great segment, and the developers probably should have stopped while they were ahead. In the third segment, you fight Ganondorf on horseback in what is the single worst segment of any final boss in a Zelda game. It isn't even difficult, just a long and tedious momentum killer where you gallop aimlessly around Hyrule Field while hoping Zelda's light arrows will hit Ganondorf, coupled with even more excessive cutscenes about light and dark mumbo-jumbo. After nearly three years of hype and build-up around the game's horseback riding, this is the best Nintendo could do? Finally, you face Ganondorf in a sword duel in the middle of Hyrule Field. It is a pretty boring location for a duel to decide the fate of the kingdom, but the other ingredients are all there for a memorable final boss. The music is an ominous rendition of Ganondorf's theme, the fight itself is decently challenging, and here you get to appreciate Twilight Princess's version of Ganondorf. But as a final boss fight, it doesn't quite deliver. By the time you make it to this portion of the endgame, you are so ready for it to be over that any enjoyment is gone. Other Zelda games either had a much shorter and more impactful final boss segment, or let you take a breather between the fights leading up to the final battle and the final battle itself. This is pretty much just your standard sword duel, and honestly wasn't worth the excessive buildup. As far as I can tell, Nintendo couldn't decide how they wanted to end Twilight Princess, went through their checklist of ideas they wanted to incorporate, 
and somewhere along the line, gave up and decided to throw all of them in. It's almost as if they looked at Ocarina of Time's final boss fight and said, Ocarina had two segments, well, we're going to have four! The result is a tedious slog of a final boss marathon that tests your patience more than your skills. But that's the Twilight Princess experience in a nutshell. All style, no substance. Nintendo didn't know what they wanted Twilight Princess to be, so they tried to cram in every possible idea because they cared more about pleasing a loud subgroup of fans than they did about making a cohesive game. In trying to ape Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess failed to understand why that game was fundamentally well-constructed and revolutionary. It is a hollow shell of a superior game in the franchise, and nowhere is that more apparent than in the final boss fight. To wrap up this section, let's revisit those bullet points from earlier on what makes Twilight Princess unique. Horseback riding. So, what did the much-touted focus on horseback combat amount to in the final game? A mini-boss fight, and the worst final boss segment in Zelda history. You can fight enemies on horseback, I guess, but it's not meaningfully different than fighting enemies on foot. Although, trampling unfortunate Boko Blins while galloping by is worth a laugh or two. Wolf Link the most time you spend as Wolf Link is for a few Tears of Light quests. In other words, the worst part of the game. To its credit, there are a few dungeon puzzles that make good use of Wolf Link's abilities, but it's nothing out of the ordinary for the series. Majora's Mask did transformations better. The Mature Tone This is the most story-heavy Zelda game, told with more realistic graphics than we saw in Wind Waker. But having more story doesn't translate to having a better story. There are many elements that receive no build-up, other elements that receive no payoff, and Link is reduced to a sidekick in his own game. When the story is as big of a focus as it is in Twilight Princess, it needs to be well told, and the story of Twilight Princess just isn't and banking on realistic graphics to elevate any game in a long-running series seems to be a short-sighted move given the march of graphical capability in video game hardware. To me, the Zelda franchise's progression has always been about innovating and developing new ways for the player to explore and be immersed in Link's world. As such, Twilight Princess is a failure with no ambition other than to remind players of a superior game. I struggle to think of a single way in which Twilight Princess differentiates itself from the rest of the series for the better. At best, it is an Ocarina of Time clone that is trying to be darker and edgier to make itself trendy. At worst, it is a black hole of creativity that set the franchise back several years and a pacifier stuck in the mouth of a whining fanbase to calm them down long enough for Nintendo to develop a game they were actually invested in. In that regard, it fails to live up to the standards set by other games in the series, and I believe is firmly in the bottom tier of Zelda. But hey, at least the CDI games gave us YouTube poop. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened after Twilight Princess? Luckily, because Twilight Princess itself brought so little to the series, everything just kept chugging along after its release. The subsequent console game, Skyward Sword, seems like it went out of its way to be different and try something new, but my feelings on whether it succeeded or not are very complicated and may be the subject of a future video. By now, the series has course-corrected with games like A Link Between Worlds and Breath of the Wild, and whatever negative repercussions Twilight Princess had on the series seem to have worn off. But I think this is a testament to the idea that the best games are those whose creators had something to share and poured their creative heart into their work, like with any piece of art. Not something designed almost entirely around being risk-free, predictable, easily produced, marketed, recycled, and plopped in our tummies. 
It may seem fun to go back and recycle the past we loved, but we end up with no sustenance. So take your link to the past, your Ocarina of Time, your Majora's Mask, your Wind Waker, your Breath of the Wild, and hold them close. Games of that quality are never a guarantee. We as Zelda fans partake in a series that has been redefining the medium for over three decades, and we're fortunate to have experienced the best of what gaming has to offer, time and time again. Thanks for watching this video. If you disagree with my assessment and you love Twilight Princess, that's totally fine. My opinions definitely don't represent those of most Zelda fans, but hopefully I've added something to the discussion surrounding this game. Feel free to share your own comments, and please subscribe so you don't miss future videos. As you're going to see on this channel, there are a lot of things I like that are widely disliked and vice versa. So stay tuned for more. I'll see you next time.